Okay. So um, I label this chapters 20, 21, and 10. Just call it chapter 20. But for the OER textbook that absolutely none of you are reading, or any of y'all have any of y'all looked at it for anything? Ever? I think I had a good time. Score. Okay. <laughs> uh, so like I said, that none of you have looked at. Technically, I'm ripping stuff out of chapter 20, 21, and 10. But guess what? We've already talked about some of this back in chapter 2. Remember when we had our friends, they got washed ashore on the island and they ended up dealing with headhunters? That's like half chapter 20, so okay, there we go. We already know this. We already covered half of it, so I'm just sort of come, coming back around and cleaning up some of the other stuff now that we know a little bit more and then finding some other stuff in there and then going at it from there. So, even though this says three chapters, just think of it as one because. Said so. I don't have anything better to say than that. But there is a concept of economies of scale. And I'm not just talking about this because it almost has my name right now. Um, but the idea is for the bigger you get, the more efficient you get. Did we talk about that at the beginning when we were talking about trade? Did you see the bigger you are, the more efficient you get? Because you can buy in bulk. You can use bigger, faster equipment to be doing things. If you've got a tractor and you can, you got a thirty thousand dollar tractor payment, and you can use that tractor on a hundred acre farm, be more efficient than somebody's got a thirty thousand dollar tractor payment and they're using it to farm only ten acres. And so you get more bang for your buck, so you're going to be more efficient financially, which will allow you to lower your price to run those other smaller farms or whatever out of business if you're going to be doing tractor thing. Uh, did I show y'all the picture of the tractor? Did y'all see it on my desktop? I'm sorry. Dude. Off the rails in there, just not like that. Oh. This tractor belonged to a former student of mine. Uh, he, he remodeled this tractor, fixed it up, and he was gone to tech, and I was there on this tractor, and the moment the thing was running, I was going to have him film me stealing it, driving down the driveway, driving away, holding a sun drop in my hand. That's what I'm holding. Have I mentioned before that I'm a child? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, the economy just get, the bigger you get, the more efficient you get. And this ends up being a big motivation for international trade. Because if I can get more efficient, the more we just use that tractor example, the more acres that I'm farming with my tractor, the lower I can lower my price. And maybe I, that will let me lower my price, maybe to be evil to run you out of business. But maybe if I can lower my price, then that will actually allow me to sell my products, not just to other Americans, but it would allow my business to sell my product in other countries. I can get my price low enough that even when the shipping costs to ship my product halfway around the planet, it still is worth it. Uh, so the idea is most of these countries that do international trade, most of these companies that do international trade, they're big. And the reason why they're, it, they're big is because they need to be big in order to have their price costs low enough to have their prices low enough to make up for that shipping costs to do the international trade. So there is kind of the idea of, well, let's let businesses get bigger and more efficient than they get. Then we can start selling our products to other people on other parts of the world and be bringing in even more money. So we're not just making money off of Americans, we're making money off of Brazilians, we're making money off of French people, we're making money off of the free people that live in Antarctica, right? So, there you go. So, if you want to go in the, get into international trade, you need to be efficient. So, if you have a government that says, well, we need to get more, we need to do more international trade, bring more money in, well, then you need to be doing things that makes it favorable for businesses to get big so they can be more efficient, so they can lower their price, so they have a chance. If you're small and inefficient, you don't really have a chance. Uh, going back to Haiti, we talked about them several weeks ago. Haiti, they don't have any people, they don't have much education, they don't have much facilities, equipment, and money to work with, so anything they produce is inherently 
not going to be getting done very efficiently. Agriculturally, they're kind of growing on rocky mountains as opposed to nice flat land that we have here. So they're not going to be able to grow, I don't know, turnips or tomatoes or anything anywhere near as efficiently as we can. So even though they can maybe grow something, they're not going to be able to grow it at a cheap enough price where somebody in another country would be willing to buy it. So they're kind of hooked. So what a country is going to end up exporting, the things that are going to be leaving the country are the things that that country has the comparative advantage in. Remember the comparative advantage from way back at the beginning of the semester when we were talking about the plumber and the, 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 the accountant doing the taxes. All right, then. Um, and just how small is the sacrifice that one of them has compared to the sacrifice that another one has, those are going to be the things that the country's going to be expect exporting. Not necessarily going to be the cheapest, but cheap helps because one of their sacrifices is giving them money. But what else are they giving up? Well, we could be growing bananas instead of coconuts. Uh, what are we giving up? And remember that whole banana coconut trade off thing? That's what establishes what it is that you end up trading. The lower opportunity costs than the person you're trading with. You might not be the cheapest out there, but if you're cheaper than somebody else, then you have an opportunity to trade with that one somebody else. So, generally, we hinted at this a time or two during the course of this semester. The closer you are together, the easier it is to trade with one another. Uh, when we were talking about exporting back in whatever that chapter was, and importing, two of our biggest three customers were Canada and Mexico, right? Because they're the closest to us, geographically. Okay, you know, they close, the shipping costs are a lot less to ship to Canada or ship from Canada than to ship from China and ship from India. So that helps. But even though China might a Chinese company might be able to make something cheaper than a Canadian company, but, a Canadian, but the shipping cost difference makes it buying it from the Canadian company end up being more affordable. So usually what we end up having is these trading blocks, which is a bunch of countries grouped together that end up trading together. We have a North American block that I think I got these names on the next slide. Yo, okay, I, I uh, okay, I got it. I need to edit that slide. The, the North American countries, South American countries, they have a trading group, Europe, Asia. I think you talked about each of them on the no, okay. I didn't name the Asian Army. What it used to be for North America was NAFTA. Right? Y'all heard of that one? North American yeah, yeah. North American Free Trade Agreement. Well, that one just that one's been in effect for 15, 20 years, but it's dead now. Being replaced by let's see, yes. United States, Mexico, Canada. I think that's the the order that it ended up in. It reminded me of U.S. Marine Corps. USMCA, the United States, Mexico, Canada. Well, it's the same three, right? But they just, it's a new agreement, and so they roll with a different name. They, did, they could have gone NAFTA 2.0 or. <laughs> but so. SAFTA. Hmm? No, it's not SAFTA or South America. Oh, uh, yeah, no. It, uh, there is half the Central American Free Trade Agreement. There isn't really a South the South American Free Trade Agreement, but that Central American Free Trade Agreement, it kind of goes fairly south. Um, Europe, we have the European Union. You know, Eastern Europe, if you go back old school, like before y'all were born, but after I was born, we had like the, you know, the, the Warsaw Pact with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union wasn't one country. The Soviet Union was like 13 countries. I think I have a bunch of problems with the Union right now. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. But give me 30 seconds and I'll come back. <laughs> but the, the Soviet Union was Russia, which it still is Russia, but it was other things too. Russia, Poland, Ukraine, all these countries. Oh, Latvia, Lithuania, Czechoslovakia. They were all part of the Soviet Union, so they were all sort of in the big, the, the lead dog of that pack was Russia. So what the Russian government was saying is what the, everybody else is going 
everything that's being based out of our but it was trade group. Uh, but the European Union now, well, the U EU is, they've got two things going on with them. Um, first, it, the way to think about the European Union is think about the United States between 1776 and 1789 for you history majors. Um, during and the first few years afterwards. What were we? We were kind of the kind of oh, well, even before that, we were individual states. They were sort of pulling together and sort of trying to cooperate on some stuff. We weren't a nation. We really were just sort of a loose confederation. That's why Articles of Federation, y'all remember that from your government class? Of course you do. History class. Yeah. Articles of Confederation, yeah. Articles of Federation. We were a confederation. We were just sort of loosely grouped together. It's like, okay, well, we're going to do our thing. You're going to do your thing. And, well, okay, we'll all just work together when it comes to trading with other countries. We'll all work together when it comes to mutual defense. But the rest of it, we're on our own. And that's kind of the position where the European Union is. With the exception of what's happening in England now. And all Other than them, Europe is on its way toward becoming the, I uh, jokingly call it, the United States of Europe. Just, they're a bunch of independents that are slowly merging more and more and more together. Now they're using the same money. Now there's no rules between it stopping you from going from one state to the next, to go from France to Italy. There's nothing stopping you from doing it. Just like there's no make work you got to do to go from North Carolina to Virginia. I have a buddy that lives in Austria and wants to graduate high school to move to Germany. Yeah, and they, the, the differences are going away. And it's taken us a while, and they've gone away here in the United States. If y'all go back and you read your U.S. history, and you go back and you, was George Washington, all they're referring to Virginia as their country. Because it was. Just like a Frenchman or French woman right now would refer to France as their country. hundred years from now, they may be talking about Europe as their country, and France is sort of their state. I mean, it's different words, kind of the same thing. They're sort of in the early steps of sort of coming together the way we did. But what's happening is the English people in Britain, not the United Kingdom, but specifically Britain, they're like, did we just get burned on this like 200 years ago? Well, no, they're like, round two. Well, no, they're actually, they're kind of taking our side of the thing. When they're starting to be, they're getting, all these countries are getting together, and they're like, actually, I don't think that this is going to work very well. Maybe this isn't for us. But actually, they're pulling to Canada. Because Canada didn't decide to join on the Canadian, what's the word, um, colony didn't decide to join with the other colonies to become the United States. Can the Canadian provinces were individual, just like Massachusetts and Maine and Virginia were individuals, but we, Massachusetts and Maine, we all pulled together, but can the Canadian provinces said no. When did Canada, as we know, come along? Uh, they came along pretty much when we did. Yeah. They're just continued colonies. Just farther north in the cold and heavy for them. But yeah, a lot nicer than us. Uh, <laughs> what? Yes, they are a lot nicer than us. But anyway, um, so this is a bunch of history lesson I wasn't planning on going into. But okay. Um, but that, that's kind of where Europe is. But England is sort of, they're like, no, 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 I don't think so. So sort of picture the end of the American Revolution. Because the American Revolution, you know, we finished, we won like 1778. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. But when did we get our Constitution? 1789. So we had like 11 years. Well, when was the Declaration of Independence? 1776. That's when the middle fingers went up and said, we're on our own, y'all. So from 76 to 89, we're running under these Articles of Confederation. We did not have the Constitution. There was no First Amendment and Second Amendment and that kind of stuff. And we're running on these loose articles of confederation. We really hadn't come together as a nation. We were just a group of individual states. You read the Declaration of Independence, and it ain't talking about a nation. 
you don't start talking nation until you get to the Constitution. And you kind of really don't really start talking about nation until Lincoln. It's when we really, you know, in the coming coming into the Civil War, that's when we really kind of grew up and actually started acting like a nation instead of acting like a nation. <laughs> but I can't believe I'm going through all of this. So, well, so, so picture, so and because people, okay, George Washington, first president. When was he elected? 1789. Ooh, well, but who was president between 1776 and 1789? It wasn't George Washington, but why is George Washington the first president of the United States? We really weren't the United States until 1789, right? We were sort of this loose confederation thing, thing. So I can't believe I'm going at all of this. this. Oh, so, but picture sometime at the end of the revolution, but we haven't written the Constitution yet. And just picture, I don't know, Massachusetts saying, nah, we don't want to be part of this anymore. That's kind of what's happening with Britain wanting to leave the European Union. Brexit, that's the name of it. Britain exit mash oh, together. Not Brexit. <laughs> that, that's what it is. It's, I love when you keep watching yourself. Britain <laughs> exit. So they turned it into Brexit. Brexit. So, so you've heard, maybe heard of Brexit. That's what it is. They're like, yeah, we signed on for this, but this is a little bit more than we signed on for. I don't think so. Think about, ooh, think about West Virginia in the Civil War. Virginia, West Virginia was part of the state of Virginia until 1861. And what ended up happening is the, Federal, the Confederate States of America is being formed, and Virginia decided, well, we're going to go, but the western counties of Virginia were like, well, we're out here in mountains. We don't have slaves. So there ain't really nothing in it for us to be getting. No, we're going to stay where we're at. And they split in half. That, and so we split in half from Virginia. It went with the south. West Virginia stayed with the north. That's, that's kind of what's happening with Brexit here. But then there's a the meantime of the European Union has a couple of anchors weighing them down while they're trying to swim. Like Greece is financially on shaky ground, Italy is financially on shaky ground. Just, their governments have really they've had they've done extra spending at right at wrong times and that kind of stuff. And you know, we're talking about times when they needed to expand their economy when they slowed down, so they really expanded their economy. So the government really did spending. But the other states are saying, well, then you can't do that because you're doing what you're doing. You're screwing up the rest of us. We're all in this together now, so you can't do that. So why is it all Britain back? Oh, no, the Britain is just like, nah, we want to leave. Uh, let's just say the Britain is from Britain. No, no, uh, they're anchors for the European Union. And so what is it happening? It's just picture of family. And what, I don't know, give me the names of some of them. Ben. Sue. Ben and Sue? Okay, how many kids? Give me some names. Uh, Sally. Sally. Mark. Mark. David. Uh, we don't want to actually pick out people whose names might actually be. Her. But wait, <laughs> we're in this together as a family. But what would happen if Ben said, no, I'm going to go out and buy a boat, and I'm going to buy a jet ski, and I'm going to buy a bunch of whatever, and there's no money left for the rest of the food? That's pretty Selfish everyone, right? <laughs> so the family's like, any family spending needs to kind of, we need to talk about it before you do anything because we're all in this together and what you do impacts everybody else. And so what ended up happening is not because Ben needed a boat, but because Greece needed to do extra spending to create more jobs to get their workers working again because of a recession. You know, back in the 10 years ago, because of a global recession, they needed to do extra spending, and they had to do extra borrowing, which is screwing up interest rates for everybody else in the family, screwing up finances for everybody else in the family. So being part of this together, there's financial rules that all the countries in the European Union have to follow. That's part of being in the European Union. Part of being in the families you gotta follow the family rules, right? Or your parents are going to keep you out, right? 
So, and so that's kind of the thing is England has decided, well, I don't think we want to follow these rules anymore. But Greece and Italy, they've been kind of like, especially Greece is like, what kind of doing what we're going to do? And they're keeping, the parents keep thumping them in the forehead saying, come on, y'all, straighten up, come on, y'all, straighten up. And they're like, but maybe uh, all of them. Yes. <laughs> Maybe because they still because they're like we still got to do with it because they're like we're not Europeans we're still Greek or now here in America here we're not Virginians we're Americans right they haven't made that transition from we're not Greek we're Europeans yet so they're like our Greekness trumps our Europeanness so they're doing what's right for Greece and getting the rest of Europe mad at them Italy's doing what's right for Italy. Right, or Italy getting the rest of Europe mad at them, and England is like, well, we were English first, European second, and we apparently don't want to play anymore. So, the European Union, this might be foreshadowing what could have happened to us in the 1770s and 1780s, but depending on your point of view, luckily, we didn't, it didn't happen. Or for some people, unfortunately, it didn't happen. That's if you're federalist or anti federalist. Go back and do your history class. So, if the UK, all of its assets better than the United States, the European Union. Try that again. The UK got out of the European Union. They're, they're trying to get out of the European Union. It's a whole bunch of. They've got to renegotiate. Okay. They've got to renegotiate all, everything with every European country. Because now it's like, okay, you can't just travel for it. Take a tunnel and go from England to France again. No, no, time to break out the passports and visas and that kind of stuff. An English company can't just take a truckload of their stuff and drive across through France and down and sell it in Italy or Switzerland. No, they've got to go through all the visas and paperwork and customs inspections and pay the taxes and tariffs and all that kind of stuff because they ain't part of the family anymore. And so all of that got thrown away when they joined the European Union and now all of that has to be renegotiated and that's why it's taken in two years and the divorce hasn't finalized yet. And the British Prime Minister here in the last week, they're just like, this is the best deal we're going to get, y'all. Tell them, y'all, she's from Southern. Uh, uh, <laughs> she, she's, like, she's been negotiating for all this time. And she's like, this is the best deal we're going to get, y'all. And a bunch of her ministers were like, this ain't good enough. And so there's an interesting chance that they're going to vote her out of office in the next few weeks. Uh, because she can't get the job. Because she can't get the job done that she really didn't. Brexit, <laughs> the, Brexit leaving the European Union was voted on as like a referendum thing before she, Prime Minister May, before she took office. The Prime Minister that was there was against the idea of leaving the European Union and when people said, no, okay, British government, get us out of this, he quit his job. And then she ended up got to getting appointed elected by Parliament to be the new prime minister. So she's like, they can pretty much self appoint anybody new and tell me one can they? Yes, because it's a parliamentary system. They yes. just do a vote of no confidence and then the prime minister's out and then they hold new elections in a couple months time and you have new PM based on the majority parties in Parliament. But they've got more than two political parties, which yeah, complicates that. They have a whole bunch. Yes, they have a whole bunch. So, a lot of times you've heard of a cold, maybe. Yeah. If, for those of you that follow the European college politics, you've heard of a, a, a coalition government. That's what ends up happening here in the United States. The Democrats or the Republicans. You know, one of the two of them is going to get a majority of votes. But over there, where they got 10 parties, you know, maybe nobody comes close to getting 50% of the vote. So, what do they do? Okay, I got I got twenty percent of the votes. You got thirty percent of the votes. Let's work together, and between the two of us, we pull our votes together. We got fifty, and we'll work together. And we'll come up with a negotiation about okay, you get the minister of finance, I'll get the minister of defense, and we build a coalition government. No, that's the way. That is what happens in a parliamentary system with more than two political parties. That's great. Yes. So anyway, so. We've done some economics, we've done some history, we've done some government, and you have the science books. I've had enough. What higher science? Science. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, we can get to some science if you want. Okay, so 
Nafta, the four and three grain. Nafta, the idea, the concept of Nafta. What we have is sort of like what's what happened with the United States. What happened in the European Union? We tried to do it with Canada. us, Canada, New Mexico. To where there's no difference between a Virginia business selling to North Carolina business versus a Virginia business selling to a Mexican business or Canadian business. That's kind of the plan here. Get rid of the trade rules, get rid of the trade barriers. So we just drive our trucks over the border, they drive their trucks over the border, we sell, they sell, no taxes, no tariffs, no none of the inspection voodoo and that kind of stuff that we'll end up talking about before this chapter is over. It's just economically speaking, we almost are treating Mexico and Canada as states number 52 and 50, 51 and 52. Go Puerto Rico. Yeah. Um, so that that's kind of the, but yeah yeah you use your own money and but we're, and we use a different money but otherwise we're kind of treated that's the way that that did. but the, the, the new whatever that is, U.S. Mexico okay, USMC yeah. right? that one that does not roll off of the top here uh, the the rules are a little bit stricter but. Um, and I haven't really spent the time be figuring it out, but that but that's still sort of the it's almost as easy to do business with a Mexican company than as a North Carolina company. It ain't quite, but almost. So NAFTA had to work. Yeah, NAFTA got killed three months ago, replaced with USMCA. Is it really bad? Is it bad? It is really bad news. Yes. Oh, uh, because President Trump said, uh, no, I'm tired of y'all taking advantage of us, and I'm not going to. It was time to renew NAFTA, and he's like, nope, we're not going to sign on. And we're going to negotiate a new deal, and if the three of us can come together, fine. If not, well, then Mexico will, will come up with an individual deal with Mexico, an individual deal with Canada. Actually, it's only been about a little over a month ago. Sounds like the Paris Agreement. Uh, is it better than NAFTA? Huh? Is it better than NAFTA or easier? Yeah. The answer is it depends. Did you say? I mean, it's going it's to be slightly more restrictive, but depending on who you are, that may be better, that may be worse. Oh, apart from the point, you just barber. It, it, it isn't quite as free. I'll put it like it isn't quite as free. It's a little bit more restrictive, a little bit tighter. So, because we trade, because countries trade with one another, Stuff happens in different countries. It depends on are you a country that does primarily importing or are you a country that does primarily exporting? For the United States, if you remember months ago, we do more importing than exporting. Where for a country like China, India, Vietnam, even, they do more exporting. So, because we're involved in trade and we end up importing, buying, more than we sell, what ends up happening to us? We're losing market share. Because we're not buying only American made TVs, we're letting somebody else make the TVs and we're buying their TVs instead of making our own. So, a bigger percentage of the TV market here in the United States is about American TVs. I'll give you a hint American TVs, 0%. There is no American company making TVs in the United States. They used to. That's yes. Yeah. Zenith was the last one, and y'all probably don't even remember Zenith, do you? Yeah. <laughs> My first high def TV almost was a Zenith. I'm glad that it wasn't because that was when they were gone like a year later. Right. Could have sold them yeah. for a collector's item or something. Yes, but probably wouldn't be able to get service if it messed up. But we lose market share. So what that means, we're not selling as much as we could. So that means, well, we ain't selling as much as we could be, which means we're not creating as many jobs as we could be. Hey, we might even be losing jobs because of this. Because we're buying from others instead of making and selling to others. So we lose jobs or we slow down job growth. We lose market share, but we get more variety. Because we're buying all of this other stuff, think about how many different cars we have to choose from besides Ford, Chevy, Chrysler, right? We got a lot more to choose from. Think about how many cell phones y'all would be, what cell phones would y'all be using if we were just using American phones? Motorola. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Bam, that's pretty much it. Nope, that's a Canadian company. Or it was before it went bankrupt and now it's... It was 
Chinese, Korean, I can't remember who. TCL? They still play Blackberries. Yeah. Uh, they, they license the Blackberry name after somebody else, and there's Blackberry Mobile is still a Canadian company making software, but then their Blackberry hardware, if you want to keep to, and those are being made by, I'm going to say TCL, somebody that's got a three initial name that is from somewhere in Asia. So does Apple and Apple is an American company, but all of their iPhones are made in manufacturing in China. So okay. awesome. they could shift. They could, they could shift manufacturing here to the United States and then be so oh, they yeah. could survive. I'll probably say they will make California. No, design in California. Read the label. It's designed in California. They're made by Foxconn, Chinese company. Yeah, that's who does the manufacturing. So, but we get more variety because we're doing the trade. We get lower prices because we're buying more from all of these other people, and so there's more more phones that are coming, more different phones coming in. So there's more competition, and when we have more options as customers, we don't have to pay as much. Our sacrifice is smaller. We have more options. Yeah, more was the last thing you paid a thousand dollars for a Motorola. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so not lowering prices all that much. Well, no, because if you go back in time to, I don't know, 1983, you might have been paying $1,000 for a Motorola cell phone. Yeah, we were Back when the cell phone was bigger than most people's pocketbooks. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> they were called yeah, a car so phone for a reason because you bolted it down on the floorboard next to your gear shift. But anyway, so money ends up leaving the country because of all of this. Because you're buying more than you're selling, you're spending more than you're making, money leaves the country. So, okay, money leaves the country. What does that mean? There's fewer dollar bills out here, right? Because our Benjamins are leaving. So when you send them away, you change them to Chinese dollars. Yes, we, we take our dollars and we convert them into yuan or whatever, and that's what we have to pay for. But that money is gone. We convert it into yuan and give it to whatever Chinese company. So then money leaves. So you, we end up getting a weird little secondary thing. Money leaves. There's fewer dollars. So what happens if there's fewer of something? The more valuable it is. So guess what? So the more you have to give me in order to get it. It's actually more deflation. It is a second push for prices getting lower because there's less American dollars out here. You've got to work that much harder to get an American dollar from me. You got to give me more, give me more cell phone, give me more carrots, give me more chainsaws, give me more whatever it is, which is more free money. It's actually a secondary push for prices going down. That's all right now. Which is great if you have money and you're planning on spending it. It sucks if you're the company that's trying to sell a product. You got to be giving your product away for even less and less and less money in return. But guess what? Your workers don't care about that kind of stuff. You still got to pay them whatever their hourly wage is. Right. So you still got to repay your loan at whatever that rate is. I mean, Haley, I borrowed $100 from her, and I come up there and say, hey, SunTrop got cheaper, so let me only pay you $90 back. She's going to do what? <laughs> Laugh. Thank you. I was expecting to roll her eyes and then laugh, but okay, she's just keeps going straight to the laughter there, right? I gotta pay her that hundred dollars, all right? Well, if not more. If not, and plus interest. Interest, the real interest rate that she's gonna charge me at least, right? So our bills, we still gotta pay them. And so the company still gotta pay their bills, but then they're getting less money coming in for the work that they're trying to do. Good if you're a worker, sucks if you're the company. So if you're an exporting country, a country like China that is doing more selling than they are buying, what ends up happening is they're slowly taking over share of the market. They're getting a bigger piece of the sales. They're getting more jobs and faster job growth. Prices in China end up going higher because the there's more of a there's more money coming in and B. Because they're selling stuff to us. The more cell phones they sell to us, the less cell phones there are on the store shelves in Chinese stores. So if there's fewer cell phones on stores in China, 
what's going to happen to the price of those cell phones in there? It's going to go up. You just, we just shifted supply back in China because they shifted that and set that supply here to America instead. So pricing end up higher. Money is coming into the country that we talked about, which helps actually into the price going higher as well. So why? Do, oh, cool. Uh, yep. Okay. Why? Why do this? Why is America doing this? Donald Trump is saying, uh, we need to stop. Oh, my. <laughs> yes, I did. I broke you. I broke you. Uh oh. I seriously need to race. Yes, I did. Okay. President Trump is saying, this is what's going on here in the United States. I'm not happy with that. So that's what these trade tariffs and that kind of stuff are going to be doing. He started out with steel and aluminum. He's putting the tariffs on there so we won't make uh, America. Making foreign steel and aluminum more expensive so then American businesses won't be buying foreign steel and aluminum. They'll buy local steel and aluminum. Instead, try to reverse this trend. But why is it that most everybody else says, no, 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 we need to go ahead and trade even though we're losing market share to China, we're losing jobs to China. Why do we do this? Cheaper. Well, there's it's slightly more complicated, but okay. Go first, just so I before I forget, go back to the end of our little hidden under island discussion the second week of class. When we get the whole world peace is more efficient, better for the environment stuff. Check. Okay, so now let's move back to this slide. Well, here's what happened. They're going to gain jobs. But prices are going to go higher. Prices are going to go higher. So Chinese workers, are, I'm going to just pick on China just for example. Chinese workers are going to say, hey, the prices of my products is going up. I need a pay raise. Just like I told y'all when inflation rate is going up, when prices go up, y'all need to ask for pay rates, right? Chinese workers are going to start saying, I need more pay. Right now, they don't have a whole lot of power in that situation because there's still plenty of other Chinese people out there saying, oh, well, shut up, get out, and not going to replace you. But the Chinese workers are demanding more pay. But it's getting toward this point where... They've got 1.2, 1.3 billion people. But when you look at how many of them are educated, smaller group. And they're getting toward the point where a bigger percentage of the educated, skilled workforce is already working. So how much do you have to pay somebody that doesn't have a job in order to get them to come to work for you? Not a lot. Maybe not a whole lot. But how much do you have to pay somebody to make them quit their current job, give up their seniority, give up their vacation days, and come work with you instead? A lot. So what's ended up happening is we're getting to the point, and it's been happening in the little bits and pieces over the last few years, but then are the, the global recession kind of slowed things down a little bit. But there's pushes where wages in China are going up. Because we don't have as many workers, we got to pay them more. It's harder to find workers, we got to pay more to get our workers. We got to pay more in order to inspire them to come and work for us, in order to inspire them to get the education, in order to inspire them to do whatever it is that we need them to do. And well, maybe we're kind of okay with that because we're getting extra money from this. Uh, okay. So, what ends up happening is okay. We're losing jobs. What's happening to wages in the United States? Trade alone, ignore everything else. Trade alone is be pushing wages down in the United States. And it's not like our wages are shrinking. Their bosses aren't giving you pay cuts, but what are they not doing? They ain't giving you pay raises, right? No pay raises in the United States. Pay raises in China. Right. So How's that play out? 
Why are we buying from them? Because they can make it so much cheaper than us. Why can they make it so much cheaper than us? Because they've got cheap labor. But what's happening? That advantage is going away. Because their wages are going up faster than our wages are. So it's one thing when you got to pay an American worker $16 an hour and a Chinese worker $3 an hour. Yeah, the best savings will cover the cost of shipping the thing overseas. But if you got to pay them $10 an hour and you only got to pay the American worker $12 an hour, that advantage goes away. So, okay, so when that happens, well, that just stops the blood, stops the blood loss, but where did we win? When y'all graduated from high school, how many of y'all moved out? None of you. Congratulations. Okay, when you graduate from college and you get your first job and you get out on your own and get that first real paycheck, what are you going to do with it? On stuff that you need is where you're going to start. The Chinese workers, metaphorically, you know, a lot of, I, I painted this picture a month ago about, you know, they were living on their daddy's farm and wearing clothes their mama made them and eating, you know, that kind of thing. You give them a little bit of money, they're going to be buying a little bit of stuff. Better food, food that mama didn't cook them, better clothes than, I'm trying not to be sexy, that mama and daddy didn't make, her, make them. Right? I mean, clothes. So, you know, get clothes made by somebody that actually has some design sense, right? Get food from somebody that actually knows how to cook. Certainly not my mother. I'm just saying. Uh, oh, that's another story. But anyway, I can't believe I recorded that. So okay. <laughs> so I'll stay on the machine. Okay. So when they get their first paychecks, when they're only making two dollars an hour, they're just buying basics. But what happens when they're making six or eight or ten dollars an hour? And they've been working for a year or two, and they've already bought them some night some better clothes. They've already bought them some better food. Yeah, buy other stuff. Once they've bought all, taking care of their needs, just like when you take care of your needs, then you do what? Take care of your wants. Yeah, climbing up Maslow's hierarchy. Good callback. So what are we going to? What are they going to be doing? They're going to be after a while. They're going to be getting into the wallet. Bought my food. I bought my clothes. I'll buy me some video games. I'm going to buy me some whatever. I'll be using the word toys. Who makes designs? Comes up with. The toys. Us. Us. <laughs> right? We're the ones that are programming the video games. Yeah, okay, somebody makes a PlayStation, but the uh, games are being programmed here. Right? Yeah. You know, the. What, what, that's the hope. That's the plan. It's a long game here. The ten, we're losing money to them now, but 10 years from now, guess what? Well, a nation of 1.2 people to 10 years, 1.2 billion people, 10 years from now is going to be about 1.8 billion people. And a good chunk of them are going to have the finances to where they're going to be interested in buying the stuff we make. That we can do because our education system is better than our education system. So there's stuff that we're a more skilled and can make it. And that money, we're going to get it back. It's a long term investment. But that's why we do it. But of course, you kind of get hosed along the way is if they get all that money and then they're like, okay, well, it's time to buy toys instead of buying the American toys, they don't buy European. European, Spanish toys, French toys, Italian toys. That's, that, 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 that's where the train can come off the tracks. But it's a long term play, and we're hoping that at least some of that money is going to come back here. But the thing, 1.2 billion in China, call it 1.8 10 years from now. 1.2 billion in India, call it 1.8, 10 years from now. Are you talking 3.6 billion people? And here in the United States, we're not even at the we're at 350 million. So think about even if we only get 10% of those extra 3.6 billion customers, that just doubled what we're buying as Americans, right? So that's the long point here. That's why I'm trying. Yes. I mean, if the price goes higher in there, why would it go to five stuff for us? Because it's I mean, you say, well, we um, trade our prices with them, so why would they go to five stuff for us? Well, well that, it, that, and that's like, eventually our price is good. That price, that's what the price advantage is going to go away, not only for the tech stuff, but 
slowly as the labor advantage costs go away. Their cost of producing will be going up. Our cost of producing comparatively is going to be going down. So the prices of American products are going to be closer to equal. So maybe they end up buying more of our stuff because of that. Prices in the long haul are going to equal out. Wages in the long haul are going to equal out. The problem is who gets screwed in the meantime? While we're waiting for this long haul to haul fall up, because in like John Maynard Keynes is a long run we're dead. And yeah, maybe 10, 15, 20 years now, a bunch of Indian and Chinese people are gonna be buying all of our stuff, but they're almost starting to death while I'm waiting 10 years for my next big deck. That's kind of a thing. And Trump was also thinking about the well, what's happening to corporate profits. Let's be honest, he's a little bit more worried about that one. He is this one. But he's going to be more worried about this one this time next year when we're election campaign and see starts coming around. Yeah, he's just going to that <laughs> but that's the thing. And that's why he's a little bit hot. Well, he, he is worried about the jobs. That's why he's so hot at General Motors. They're going to shut down five plants in the United States because they're not selling you know, like Shady Bolt and Shady Cruise and that their cars that we ain't buying anymore. And they're like, well, people aren't buying it. We're just going to stop making it. And he's like, but why don't you keep making whatever here in the United States and close down some plants in China? And whatever cars you were selling in China, build those here in the United States and put them on a ship and send them over to China instead of those paying Chinese workers to do it. But ain't quite that bad. I don't know. Stay out of that. At least Amazon's expanding. Yes. <laughs> Two new headquarters. And Google, <laughs> and Google just bought them a whole new business park there in Mountain View. If we're going to have more jobs over here, are we going to get paid less? But it's all going to balance out. I mean, we're, wages are not growing as fast here in the United States. I mean, because we're losing jobs in the United States. But then what should end up happening later when things balance out? Our job growth could be equal to theirs. Our wage growth will be equal to theirs. And we things should pick up. And what President Trump is hoping for is if we can do these trade barriers, barriers, these tariffs and stuff, if we can slow this down, we'll end up prefer oh I didn't actually ever we'll end up reversing from the well I can get wages growing a little bit faster than they are already growing. They aren't growing very fast here in the United States. Other stuff is picked up in the economy faster than wages, but wages are growing. The unfortunate thing price of housing is growing faster than wage growth. So, so if you can afford it, buy your house now while your paycheck will still let you afford it because if you wait yeah, price of that house, the price of the house keep going. So, what is President Trump trying to do is protectionism. That's the word. Trying to limit trade in order to protect the domestic economy, protect jobs here yeah, in the United States, protect jobs in the United States, protect different industries, protect the companies from going bankrupt here in the United States. That's the goal of protectionism. And the trade war thing that he's pitching is Protectionism, pure and simple. And to do protectionism, you throw enough hurdles, you throw enough obstacles, barriers. You know, a barrier is an obstacle to block. It's anything that will slow down or stop trade. A tariff is what? Y'all know this government class. Tax on um, imports, exports. Yes, it's an import tax. If you're, if Okay, I'll pick out Japan for a minute. Japan, you're going to sell a Toyota here in the United States. But we're going to put a $3,000 tax on that Toyota. So what are you going to end up doing? You're going to add that $3,000 onto the price tag of the Toyota dealership to try to make that Toyota be not so much cheaper than an American car. Then somebody's going to go along and say, well, Ford costs the same as a Toyota. Well, maybe I'll be Ford. Maybe I'll get the Toyota. Let me look. But right now, if the Ford and Toyota, if the Toyota is three thousand dollars cheaper than the Ford, where's everybody going first? We're going to the Toyota dealership, right? And then there's all the whatever. Well, the Japanese cars are better quality, better fuel mileage. I'm like, hey, you're already fighting it. That's the thing there is if we can raise the price, to take away the advantage that Chinese products have from the cheap labor by adding a tax to their costs to increase the cost of the Chinese products in the meter. That's what we're talking about here. We, 
We're not going to do an export tax. Because the last thing that the American government wants is the American business to have an even harder time selling your product to everybody else. The American government wants their American businesses to sell as much as they can to whomever they can because the more they sell, the more money they make, the more they the taxes they get paid, right? The more bribes to policies they get to hide. So that's it. so it's not a, there is 99.999999 percent of the tariffs are going to be import tariffs. There might occasionally be an export one, but it's just no, you don't do it. So is it cheaper to buy stuff from Japan and ship it over here or to just buy the stuff that we're Japan? Say for a car. Is it cheaper to buy it from Japan and ship it over here or to buy it from Japan and the other countries? Right now, still, it's cheaper to buy a Japanese car than to buy a comparable American. No, I'm not saying buying it from Japan and ship it over here. Oh, the, the, well, we don't buy it. From Japan, the Japanese, the, the, the Honda dealership in America buys it from Japan, ships it over, and then they sell it to us. The closest thing to what you're trying to think about is, say, like a luxury car that's only made in one country. Yeah. Or like a Ferrari maybe. or something like that, maybe, kind of thing that are only made in Italy. Well, you, but still, you there's dealerships and give it up. But are you asking a Toyota built in yes, Japan yes. versus the Toyota built in Kentucky? Is that what you're asking? Are you sure? You, 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 okay. you don't sound like that. <laughs> Toyota has manufacturing plants in Kentucky. Are you in Ohio? Actually, Ohio. So, the question are you asking which is cheaper, a Corolla built in Tokyo or a Corolla built in Ohio? Yeah. It's going to end up being the same price. Because they're going to they're gonna sell them the same price either way. It just don't make more profit off of one versus the other. And and then that, that, that would change depending on exchange yeah. rates, depending on whatever the tariff happens to be. Actually, I found this kind of um, funny. So my uncle, um, I'm half Japanese, so my family still lives in Japan. Okay. And my <laughs> uncle has his car that as a provider from a has his car made by Toyota, but it's a car that's only made in America. So he had it built. America bought it when he was over here, had it shipped with him when yeah. he was back. Oh, you can do that. People get it. Uh, don't hear as much of it happening that way, but like that. The other way around. Yeah. yeah, other way around. Like uh, like when my father was in the Navy when he was over in Europe or whatever, there were people they would buy a car in Europe and it would be worth it for them to buy the car in Europe and then ship it over to America rather than coming in. And have a way for them when they yes, have yeah, there's cars made in other countries that are not made here yeah. by Toyota or any yes. other company. And I'm saying it's cheap by those who ship it on just buy it. If cars. they'll let you buy it, 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 it depends. I think I, I've got a good answer for that. It, it probably doesn't depend. So. There's a discussion because of the increased tariffs, what they're looking at. What Trump was talking about the other day, this next level of it. I, and he's mad at General Motors, I talked about for closing down plants in America and keep still making cars from China. Well, he's mad at Apple because all of your iPhones are designed in California but manufactured in China. So, President Trump was talking about taking a 10% tariff on iPhones. So, imagine your $1,000 iPhone now being an $1,100 iPhone. And if he's not happy, if he, if he continues to not be happy, he is trying to escalate it all the way up to 25%. But your thousand dollar iPhone 10 is 10s or whatever is going to be a twelve hundred fifty dollar iPhone. Yes. Google all the way. Uh, but then there's some people that are like, well, probably what's going to happen is if they bump it 10%, Apple is probably going to eat it. They're not going to raise their practice. People are going to be like, dude, it's bad enough. Do you want us to pay $1,000? Well, $1,100? No. That's kind of, and so that going into four digits for a cell phone, $1,000, breaking that $1,000 barrier is a big psychological barrier, and they're going to end up losing a bunch of sales, or Apple's going to end up, but we would rather make less profit per phone and sell a bunch more of them and keep that price lower and eat 
this tax. It's probably what's going to happen. Of course, that's going to make Trump still be mad and probably NFL's going to go up to 25%. And maybe they'll make that. But then, of course, but then this is a lot of this negotiating tactic with Apple or whatever, and then Apple's going to give in and they're going to say, well, I'll tell you what, what we'll do. We, 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 we can't move the iPhone production over here, but the, I don't know, the wireless earbuds will make some of them in the plane in Texas if you'll back off. Yeah. It's a negotiating tactic, probably. Oh, yeah, they're only, yeah, it's not hundred to one. It could be a couple hundred, but not a whole lot more than that. Yes. But anyway, no. and you're getting an inferior camera, you can fix it. So I might just you know, take a picture in the dark and show you how not dark it is. Anyway, but a tariff is a tax. Uh, all those imported goods to try to get rid of that price endurance. A quota is what is a quota? Uh, how much you have to make, right? Isn't it a price? For the market? It's not a price. But Jenny is there, but she didn't quite work. Yeah, it's a it's a numerical limit. You can sell to Toyota. You can sell how Corollas for whatever price makes you happy. But you can only sell 3,000 of them a year. That's a limit. You can only bring in 3,000 of them. If you sell those 3,000 for $50,000 each, you can sell them for 5,000. It don't matter. You can only sell 3,000 of them. Well, if you're a buy shoe, the quota is actually a limit. Like on a stock or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Two of them, uh, 50 cases an hour or something. Oh, my. Okay. Yeah. It, it, it's a numerical limit. In, Bobby's case at work, he's got a minimum minimum amount of work he has to do. In this case, it's a maximum amount of stuff, product that they can ship in. So, okay, well, yeah, Toyota, maybe the Corolla that they can sell is cheaper than Ford, but we're only letting them bring in 3,000 of them in a year, and then once there's 3,000 sold, and everybody else is going to do what? They got no choice but to go buy the Ford, and we still win, right? That's the thing for Corolla. Customs restrictions. <laughs> this is my favorite. <laughs> This is, have you ever gone through airport and gone through customs? Yeah. You, yeah, they're going through there and then you, when, when you come in, they're like, you, you, we need to check your bags, are you smuggling in any food, do you have any animals? Did you, did you buy anything over there that you need to clear, we need to tax you on and all that kind of stuff? You smuggle them. So, but it goes beyond. Go. When the ship full of Toyota Corollas, I'm just sticking with the Corollas, when the ship full of Corollas is coming in, you know, well, first, it's like, well, before that ship can dock, if you unload it, well, we're going to go on and count how many corollas there are, and we're going to put a little sticker on there so you, we get ta you pay you taxes for these, right? But then there's other restrictions that can come in there, like, well, we also are going to do a safety inspection. We also are going to search this entire ship from top to bottom and make sure that there's no drugs being smuggled aboard this ship before we let it dock. We're going to take apart all these cars to make sure there's no child pornography hidden inside any of these cars. We're going to be digging through everything on this ship to make sure that there's no terrorists hiding somewhere on here. So, yeah, we're not going to tax you on it, but I'm uh, sorry, doing all the stuff that we got to do, it might be six months before you can actually dock and unload it. Yeah, I, was actually, I was kind of confused. I went on this cruise to Jamaica, and this little itty-bitty boat of like five people came up next to the ship and like the ship dropped a ladder down to them and they started like board the ship and I'm like I'm, I'm trying to figure out what this is and I guess I don't know what that was it's more like a custom type thing. Um that was probably your harbor pilot. Oh. Uh just when you're pulling into a harbor. Yeah, just you, you, they bring on the pilot that knows the water so they know where it's deep, where it's shallow and where so they're up there advising, you know, okay, when you get up here, you need to steer a little bit to the right. All that kind of stuff. That's what they're bringing on. But, yeah. But then when the ship docks, the customs people come in before you can unload, get off of the ship. It's more than just lowering a gang flanking and saying, get out, y'all. The customs people will do their little thing too. But it, it, you can set kind of some rules and stuff. Like it, and the, you, can, you can slide out and get some games going on here. And the... Yeah. So instead of, okay, you build cars, it takes 10 days for the car to come over here, the ship to come across the ocean. Well, then it takes another 10 days before we can actually inspect it and unload the ship. So suddenly, we've doubled the amount of time it takes for you to deliver cars. So what do you need to do? Have more boats. 
which is going to cost you more money in order to get the same amount of cars here in the country, right? Have a bigger boat. Or have a bigger boat. Well, it's going to take us that much longer to inspect it because it's that much bigger of a boat. But a bigger boat is more expensive. A second boat is more expensive. Either way, making it more expensive and time consuming for people to bring product into the country. Then it's going to cost us more money to get all the people in with that, you know, training and all that. Well, yeah, the TSA agents and that kind of stuff. And Not as much as an extra boat, though. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> It's job creation here in the United States. Storage, that's what we're looking for. We're creating jobs and we're going to end up taxing who's going to end up paying for these inspectors. That's going to be part of the fees, the inspection fees that the Toyota company's going to have to pay to have that ship inspected. So the government's okay with that. But it's slowing down this stuff coming in. And then there's other rules restrictions. There's things that, you know, there are certain products you say you cannot import. There's certain seeds you cannot import because by bringing in this kind of seed, it might end up you, it might end up killing other varieties of that same kind of plant here. You bring up. They were just talking about it in plant science class. I can't remember what it was, but I mean, there's like disease. Yeah, just there, you bring in one variety of a tomato. I'll just use that and by planting that one and all the whatever goes here, we'll end up killing all of the other tomato plants. And you only have that one left. You know, there's rules. Licensing requirements. This is getting permission to do something like any of you. Oh, I'm wearing the Carolina Panthers shirt. Yes, I mean, those of you watching now. Uh, I'm wearing Carolina Panthers shirt. Did Carolina Panthers make this? Oh, no. no, they're not a t-shirt company or publisher, oh, whatever the shirt is. They're not a shirt company. They're a football team. Uh, kind of questionable after these last <laughs> But they, so what did they do is, whoever this is, thank you, whoever, I don't know who made this one, but it, some clothing company says, instead of just making a black shirt, we can make a black shirt that's got your logo on and sell for a whole lot more money. So how about we pay you a little bit of money and you let us use your logo on clothing. So we're getting a licensing thing. So the Panthers are getting a licensing fee. This company is paying to get a license to use their logo on clothing. So they can make money for no extra work. Yeah, so the team is making money for no extra work, and the more successful the team is on the field, the more people don't want to buy shirts, the more money they make. And so it's just, it's, it's a craving. But that's the way it works, colleges and all this kind of stuff. That's the way this kind of thing works. Well, you can do some licensing overseas. That, to a certain extent, that's what like McDonald's. When you buy a franchise at McDonald's, you bought the license, you bought the right to be the only person in town making a burger called a Big Mac in a building with the Golden Arches out front. Did you know the Golden Arches are supposed to be two French fries? I didn't realize that. that we put that one together a few months ago, the Golden Arches and a pair of French fries. The so right thing that says McDonald's is supposed to be the French fry box and the French fries are coming out. Golden Arches. There you go. Those are some of them. Yes. But they're from the 1950s, so what do you expect? But anyway, but, but just, so there's like licensing requirements, so you know, okay, you can come in and do stuff, but there's rules, you gotta pay, there's fees, you gotta pay. Um, oh, jumping down to the ownership partnership rules, you can do business in China. Levi's, I'm gonna go with Levi's, because they were a classic example back in the 90s. Levi's, if Levi's wants to make jeans, sell jeans in China, they would love for 1.2 billion sets of legs wearing Levi's jeans. The Chinese government says, well, if you're going to be selling your product here in China, at least half of your product needs to be made by a Chinese company. You've got to do some kind of partnership. Or we're not letting you come in. I mean, they will agree because it's cheaper for them to make it over here anyway. Probably, yes. Um, but it's making that Chinese. Company more money as well. Yeah, it's, 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 that's it. the Chinese company is getting half of the money, the Chinese company is getting half of the profit, so you guys like, they're not getting as much money as they could if they just made them all themselves and got all the profit themselves. But yeah, there's so rules. And are you, yeah, are you okay with doing this? Or are you not okay with doing this? And Levi, actually, the, the, the classic case study back in the 90s, they were like, no. 
we we we've got our quality standards we got whatever we make our own jeans and no so it, it was a big thing when levi said we're not going to china we're going to stay out of china but then they ended up being a problem called counterfeiting and it turned out, well, you know, there's a bunch of people in China wearing Levi's jeans. They just weren't made by Levi's. They had Levi's name on them. We're not made by Levi's for us incorporated. And Levi's is getting zero dollars for it. So what did they end up doing? Oh, Crap. And a few years later, they went to China. They partnered up with whoever because they're like, if people wearing Levi's jeans, there are jeans with our names on it. We need to at least be oh, there, <laughs> establishing the quality roles that we want to and at least getting part of the profit. But part of the profits, as Bobby would say, is better than none of the profits. But are you okay with only getting part of the profit? They can't sue them. If they can find a way to doing counterfeiting, they could sue them. I saw and they could try, but the Chinese court system, was, they tend to favor Chinese companies over foreign companies when it comes to counterfeiting lawsuits. I saw this Chinese guy in the airport, he was wearing some Nikes, but I noticed the check was backwards on the shoe. So maybe EKIN, EKIN, over the thank you beverage. Okay, and there may be some voluntary export restrictions. Like the American government has some rules, there are some things that we make here in the United States that we will not let you sell to other people. There are certain technologies that we won't let you sell to anybody, or we won't let you sell to certain people. But right now, we're not selling pretty much anything to it. Iran. Yeah. We're uh, selling pretty much nothing to Cuba. We're selling pretty much nothing to North Korea. You know, and, and, get out. <laughs> yes. I um, Um, I don't think anything is approved. And the more interesting thing is how the North Korean and South Korean presidents have liked to talk to each other slightly, but that's more interesting when they're. But, but there, there's some of this guy, and even the companies are going to do a little bit of the, this kind of. I can't believe I'm going here. Airplanes. The big secret for a jet airplane is the, the, the big thing. The wing. It ain't the engines, it ain't it's the wing. That's the thing. The shape of it, the design of it, the curvature of it, as far as the negative air pressure, all that, the lift and all that, the wing is the thing. So we're like Boeing, maybe like, okay, well we'll let you bake the seats, we'll make you even let build the fuselage and all that kind of stuff, but we're gonna make the wing. Because we don't want anybody else to get hold of our secret sauce. So we're gonna hold on to that. So you get some of that kind of stuff going on as well, because if we give away the wing technology, then they have the wing technology, then what do they need us for anymore? And we just, you know, so just, there's some stuff. But why would, what, what are the arguments for saying, no, 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 let's back off on this trade, let's do this protectionism. The arguments that the Trump administration, among others, some of that they're making is, well, number one, protect jobs. The next one is national security, which I may have talked about at the beginning of the semester when we talked trade the first time. There's national security then. Right now, what is it? How many TVs are made in the United States? Zero. So what happens? And that's the other about when somebody likes those small cameras and ad Oh, what? Yeah, there, there could be the, okay, all of our TVs are being made by some partner, so we got to make sure that there's no secret little chip hidden on the motherboards of them. Will microphones to it to be listening in on stuff, or if we have little cameras to be watching in on stuff, so they're watching us while we're watching them and all that. Just, there was a thing about a month ago, I keep thinking of the name of the company, a computer motherboard company, that they were accused of having a special computer chip on ISRA servers that was capturing the information and passwords and that kind of stuff. These are like, like Comcast and Amazon and Facebook who are using these motherboards in their networks and just capturing information, sending it back. And so, I mean, those kind of things there. So there's that national security, but then there's also the, well, what if, you could, uh, absurd example here, what if because of our trade? Well, the weather in Mexico is more conducive to growing tomatoes than the weather here in America is. So, because they had a comparative advantage because of the weather, 
what is happening? Mexican tomatoes are cheaper than American tomatoes, and so all American tomato farmers say, forget about it. So suddenly, we're completely 100% dependent on Mexico for our tomatoes. And then what happens if we go to war with Mexico? No more tomatoes. And is that a problem? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Well, no pizza. Oh, oh yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, it's a national security issue there. Yeah. So you know, it's like scurvy. I use it. Tomatoes can get served with vitamin C. Keep our soldiers from getting scurvy and all like that. I was in a certain example. I had. But you know, there's some national security thing. We need to be maybe self-sufficient. But as things go sideways with our trading partners, yeah. for some reason we got South Korea, China, Japan. We got them angry with us, then no new TVs. No new phone, well, yeah, Taiwan, yeah, yeah. No new phones, except well, maybe Motorola reps. We kind of be stuck for a while, right? Because we would have to relearn how to make TVs, right? Yes, we would have to relearn how to make TVs and rebuild plants to make them. No, we don't have the buildings that are there, we don't have any there, so we didn't. So how long would it be if we had had a disagreement with those three countries right now? How long would it be before the next new TV hit market? It might be a couple of years, right? And in the meantime, well, what happens if your TV blows up? You ain't watching that for a while unless you bring it on your little four-inch, five-inch screen on your phone. Bobby's like, well, I got a dope, so I got a six-inch, six-inch <laughs> set up on the mantle. Yes. <laughs> we sit there and hold a pair of binoculars up and stare at the TV. Okay. The, if we're not if we're not trading with people, then we're making everything that we do, and that gives us diversification. We're not just making video games and toasters. We're also making TVs. We're also growing tomatoes. We have diversification that gives us stability here. So if we're instead of having all of our eggs in the one or two baskets, then something goes wrong in one of those industries, then we're stuck. We're spread out. We're more stable. Um, infant industry. New technologies, we want to protect those. So we say you can't trade this. We're not going to let any. We've got this new business, and we're not going to let anybody import anything that this new company is trying to do because we want this company to have exclusive rights to sell in this country to make enough money so they will survive because we think this is important for the future. Kind of thing. And then dumping, selling below cost. And if we think that there's some companies out there that they're purposely selling their products with less than it costs them to make it because they're trying to run our businesses out of business because you're being evil. Well, we don't want that to happen. That's unfair. And so we want to protect against that kind of stuff. Those are the reasons why you might want to try to slow down trade. The law of The dumping, it is against the law for an American company to do that. Uh, and we generally aren't going to be happy about a foreign company trying to do that. You know, what was they gain? They lower their price, and I can't stay in business anymore, then I go out of business. And then they raise their price. Then they're the only game in town, and they can raise their price or whatever, to whatever they want. Monopoly. But when, what happens when they do slow down trade? Well, those things that we just like. If we're not going to buy anything from China anymore, what's China not going to do? Buy it from us anymore, right? So those things that we used to make and sell to them, we're going to lose jobs in those industries, right? So we may gain jobs making the stuff that we used to buy from China, but we're going to lose jobs making the stuff that, uh, from making the stuff that we used to sell to them. We're going to get higher prices. Because we're not being able to import the cheapest from the people that had the advantage, now we've got the, we're buying from people that don't have the comparative advantage. They're the ones that are making our products. Prices are going to be higher. We're going to have less variety. We won't have as many foreign made products to choose from, so we're just stuck choosing between the American brands. The government is going to have to spend money and time to be creating these rules and enforcing these rules, hiring the inspectors that Sam was worried about to be going out there on the ships and investigating and looking around and making sure that there's not no child porn and nuclear weapons and drugs and that kind of stuff on the ships. That costs money. And where's that money coming from? Us. Us. Taxes. 
but just the companies are going to be making less profit and you and I were maybe losing jobs, some of us are losing jobs, and so overall the government's going to be making less money in taxes. So what do they got to do? Try to get it out of us. Higher taxes, part two. And then who's going to be family-wise, low-income families are going to be the ones hurt the worst because they're the ones that, like you and I, we spend all 100% of our paycheck. So when prices go up, that impacts what happens to all 100% of our paycheck. Bill Gates spends 1% of his paycheck, right? So if prices go up, that's only impacting 1% of his paycheck, right? So it's going to hurt us low-income people a lot more than it's going to hurt the high-income people, especially people like grandma on fixed income. But isn't that going to equal in the long run because we're just going to make the stuff that we need and the stuff that we used to sell to the public so they would end up canceling each other? Hopefully, maybe. It's going to take a while. Yeah, yeah it's going to take a while. You're going to have people that are going to lose your job in the transition. Okay, I was making video games that we were selling to China, and now I've got to quit that and retrain myself in how to make socks and t-shirts because we're not importing those anymore. So, <laughs> Jenny's on the right. But then, okay, which job pays more? That technology job or a job making socks? So you kind of have that problem going on, too. Or you just get into the TV business. Yes. And guess what? All the American TV companies have that business. Yeah. So, if protectionism, if you okay, protectionism is okay. We need to slow things down. Well, what if you want to speed things up? How close to the end are we? Nowhere near the end. Uh, nowhere near. Oh, we're halfway there. But now I'm going to say this one and then go because this is the good solid one. So. Protectionism is slowing things down, but then there's the other argument about let's speed things up, we can create jobs, we can have that long, long term play where 20 years from now we'll be making a bunch of money from China and a bunch of money from India, and we get in the world peace and better for the environment and all that kind of stuff. Can't we all get along? So let's make it easier. Well, how can we make it easier? Improve technology, communication technology. Where we can place an order, you can order something from a Chinese company by going out on the internet, click, 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 and boom, and it's automatically translated, and they automatically have an address correctly, and you're no confusion as far as you talking to somebody that's got an accent, and they think you've got an accent, right? Just the communication technology makes things faster and easier. Transportation technology, we can get the stuff across the ocean a whole lot faster, but if we got big boats, and hey, we can throw it on airplane if we can get it here overnight, as opposed to sea truck. A big boat with a sail that would take you like four months and maybe everything gets there. Yes. World peace will help trade. Because when we got a loaded ship, we can send it across the ocean. They like, well, we got a loaded ship, we gotta wait until a bunch of other ships are loaded up and we can get together with some aircraft carriers and destroyers and that kind of stuff and go with a convoy and hope that the submarines don't sink us. Right. Peace is good for trade. Reducing all of those hurdles, lowering the taxes. Lowering all of the inspection voodoo and crap and making sure that there's no nuclear kitty porn and that kind of stuff on all of that stuff. Get rid of all that red tape and all that kind of stuff. Getting rid of the obstacles will make it so smoother and trade you. Y'all with me? So don't be focusing on nuclear kitty porn. It's <laughs> 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 so lovely to look on her face. It's like, oh my. But anyway, you know, so just. Unfortunately, that's going to be the stopping point. The last thing that y'all are going to remember for the next five days, possibly going to be here. Yes, the last thing they're going to hear on the recording will be online. I'm so tired. But anyway, uh, so <laughs> there is, well, there's an interesting chance my goal is to finish this chapter on Tuesday and then Thursday. I'll talk a couple minutes about the test if I don't talk about it Tuesday. And there's a and we'll do the consumption savings and investment chapter because it's fast. That's my goal to finish that. So, and yes. Tuesday. so class Tuesday, class Thursday, and then the test is the following Thursday. And that's it. So y'all only got to see me three more times this semester. So I have to try to continue here and certainly continue to live. That would be cold. Wow. 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 W